Good morning. Um, I'm Robert Crosby, Hatchery Coordinator for the River P Hatchery Habitat Trust. Uh, to be honest with you, I was sitting there, I was quite depressed about <laughs> all the problems that we hear about. Uh, I thought <coughs> probably we might have a wee bit of a, a lifting spirit with some of the results that we get. Uh, this is our story. The, beginning, the, the project, the, the, the idea came about in 2009 with a bunch of local anglers on the rivers, fish, fish weren't there in the numbers that they were. We actually thought it's about time we actually done something. So a group of us, which was included the New Stewart Angler Association, decided to, the way to go forward to build a hatchery. We, we talked about it in 2009, we Permission to go ahead, we had permission from the River Board, etc. I think we've gone ahead. The actual project started in March 2010. Uh, as you can see, we completed it in 2000, October 2010. <coughs> that, when we built that hatchery, you can see the build cost there is at 37,140. Realistically, if we had paid for everything in that hatchery at the time, we would have paid 80 odd thousand. Most of that come from local businesses, fundraising, uh, support from the Anglican Club. I mean, the Anglican Club paid the biggest part of that, actually. At the time, the local river board didn't give us any money at all for it at that point. Uh, so, 2010 was basically, we done a kind of pilot project. Rather, rather than go straight in there and do the full amount that we were thinking of, we went in and we done 60,000. And I don't know if you can remember 2010, it was the hardest winter we had for years. Uh, everything, when you went in in the morning, there was an inch of ice on the floor. The these wee fish, the eggs and everything survived through that. So we knew then, you know, in the first year, what we had set up at that point was going to work. That year, the following year, we released these 60,000 fry. They were all into the, a burn called the Pink Kiln Burn, which again is an easy burn to monitor. And it's not a huge river system. Uh, we'll, we'll better not forget the volunteers. Uh, the volunteers, I mean, we were, we were away to the likes of game fairs, etc. We had stands up, we had raffles, we had clay pigeon shoots, <coughs> sport rallies. And that's where all the money come about. That is a hatchery. The only thing I will say now, we thought that was quite large. I think I think it's 68 feet by 20, I think. <coughs> now, if I was doing that, I'd want it twice the size. Because <laughs> whatever you do, you grow it. Because the problem, what, you, what you forget about is the wee fish that you're rearing. You know, you start off with 20,000 in a tank, Within three, three or four weeks, that tank's bulging. So you've got to start splitting these up all the time. Yeah, that's just a view of inside the hatchery. My biggest problem is, if you, on the right hand picture, you'll see the troughs that we actually have the eggs in. Now, you'll see later on in the pictures, I have to take them out, to then move tanks back in. That's where I'm, that's where I'm struggling for space now. <coughs> That's us again taking the troughs away and we're setting up our incubator system, uh, which we'll again will explain once we come to the incubator. The incubator <coughs> made a, a huge difference. And uh, again, the incubator idea come from uh, we went and visited another hatchery and the idea was born there. We just didn't have the same amount of money as they had. so. The, 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 the maybe drums rather than big fancy marine ply uh, incubators. Reasons for stocking. One of our biggest problems is acidification. I mean, I don't know if any of you know Galloway Forest uh, is huge in citrus fruit. Uh, we, we actually are running some Sunday water monitoring, which you'll see shortly, uh, and some of the figures are, are horrific. And that, that, that is one of the reasons why we, we are mitigating against acidification. Although 
the bonus 50 you would be you can see yourself you could mitigate against so many other reasons for stocking. The great habitat <coughs> again a lot of that's caused by land use. Uh, again mainly ours is forestry, which is FLS land. Increased space events, I said somebody earlier on today, you'll all have seen it this year, I mean we're continually having big water. And, and I don't think it's the big water that actually causes the problem, it's the speed they come down at now. I mean they don't come down nice and gently like they used to do, it's a, it's a flush. Uh, it's just ripping things out. Uh, and I'm quite sure now we're getting a lot of red, red washout. And of course, when we've got all these big waters, we <laughs> a problem we're having some patient. You know, all, all the wash off, I mean, again, forestry practices, you know, they, they'll, they'll not stop going in and cutting trees down just because it's wet. So they, they're breaking the ground up, that all goes into ditches, straight into your water system. In fact, this, this is the first year since we set up the hatchery, I've got a centre tank, which is meant to be a silk trap. Uh, two or three folk have seen it. Normally, I shut it out the hatchway down in October. I clean it out, and that does me to the following October. I cleaned it out this October, and I had to clean it out in January. We had that much silt in it this year. That just shows you what has come down in these spate events this year. And obviously, the last one, we've all hit on it today. Our biggest problem is febs, fish eating bugs. We don't seem to have a huge problem with seals. Uh, that might increase because obviously the nets are no longer there, which had the right to, to dispatch the seal. The aims, the reason why we are stocking out areas of catchment which currently support no or very low populations of wild fish. That, that's all done through electrofishing surveys. Habitat. <laughs> we're, we're, we're continually doing habitat works. Most of that is on, again, FLS land, which is cutting the regen in Sitka Spruce. The, the, the regen and the self seed Sitka Spruce are actually filling up the spaces that were left as buffer zones. I mean, we, we were cutting trees at a 35 year old, and basically what they do is they just shade out the whole burn. You know, there's just there's nothing that affects the. the Invertebrates of all lot. So we, we are cutting them away, give, trying to give ourselves a buffer zone of about 30 metres. That, that's what we're allowed to do unless it's, <coughs> if it's commercial crop and it was one metre away, we couldn't touch it. But if it's not commercial, if it's self seeded, we can clear that back to 30 metres. Once we clear that back, we are then planting broadleaf trees in groups. We've been doing that now for about eight, nine years. Uh, the only difference what we are doing with that is we are actually stocking these places that we're doing that on as well. So, apart from just having good habitat, we've actually got fish in these areas as well. Uh, education, we, we work a lot with schools. Just, uh, again, you only need to look in this room. There's not many youngsters amongst us. <laughs> and, and if we don't educate these young, young ones to go on behind us, what, what, what we're going to do today is going to be pointless. So don't bring the corn behind us to do it. As I said earlier on, identifying stocking sites using electric fishing. Uh, also, once we've stocked fish, we go back and we electrofish these same sites uh, just to see how well they survive, looking at the size of them and just densities. We've got the local fisheries trust aid, but they have produced a stocking document for us since we started. Uh, that, that's produced on a yearly basis. We've been science led, probably, I think some of us in here will agree, there's an awful lot of negativity in it. But over the years, we have actually managed to get some positive stuff put back into it. Walking the river banks, the we're doing it all the time, walking the river banks again, looking for the same things that Dave was talking about, barriers. Uh, we, we are not so bad with weirs, etc., water extraction or anything like that. Our biggest problem, again, is probably going back to trees. You know, you're, you're looking for basically dams. You know, if it's left alone, it just builds up and some of them just get passable. 
uh, organise bird counts to assess the fishing bird number, to apply for a licence. The, the licence every year we get, we normally get to a licence for seven cosanders and sea corners. Uh, it, it's not an awful lot, but it lets us get out there. And in that process, we're also doing a lot of scaring as well. Uh, which we found, we found over the years, even being a presence on the river at that time of year, moving them on. You know, and if there's groups of them, if there's a group of them and you still get birds on your license, we'll try and take one out of the group. Uh, and just try and keep, these, keep them on the move. But uh, again, that's going to be something that's been continuing for years. Uh, again, we're uh, engaging with local schools, organising school visits, we let them see the, the whole process of what the hatchery is, stripping fish. Uh, the grass has come out and help us put a few fry in. Uh, again, one of, one of the, the good thing about doing that is what David again hit on earlier on, that takes boxes for us to actually get some more <coughs> funding, uh, which is obviously important for us as well. Licensing, the, the hatchery itself, it was licensed at the very start through Marine Scotland. Uh, we obviously need a licence for water extraction, that, that's through SEPA. Uh, the broodstock capture licence, we have to apply for that every year, again that's, that's Marine Scotland. And the broodstock, what we tend to get is, is it 2% of the rod catch. So for every 100 fish that are caught by rod, we'll be over 20 fish for broodstock. Most years we're getting a licence to take 60 to 70 brim fish. Uh, electrofishing, we're electrofishing for brim stock. Uh, we need the licence for that. And we also need the licence to electrofish to do the surveys or the fry surveys. We've just had the licence for fish eating birds. That's applied for every year. We tend to get it in January every year. And it runs through the end of May, Jamie, I think. <coughs> We, we can shoot female cosanders up to the end of April. In May, we're allowed to shoot males. But say we've, only got, we've only got seven. Uh, and obviously, we need various landowners' permissions to go on to catch brood stock, etc. And one of the big landowners, again, is FLS. Which <coughs> what we hit on earlier on here about the uh, acidity. <laughs> we're running a storm in this now. And that, that is really interesting because if you look at the minimum pH we were hitting was 3.7. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's almost acid. Yeah. And surprisingly enough, I mean, if you look earlier in the year, we were hitting down to fours and it was quite regular at four. But the fish in the bottom that year, this year, survived really well. I think it was two years ago, three years ago, we lost a whole lot. Every, every fish in that bottom, when we went to electrofish the fry, there wasn't one fish survived. You can also see mac maximum temperature there in the summer was 24.4. Uh, I mean, that's probably one of the reasons why we're planting trees as well. You know, you get this shade and cover on it. So we're going to lift that now, and we're going to go and look now and see if there's anything that we can do to try and make some changes. I mean, that, that might just be increasing buffer zones, changing practices. You can see the events, you can see the events of the pH. I mean, if you imagine a flood, as soon as you get a flood, it <laughs> down, down it goes. You get a wee dry spell, you can see there in, what's that, in May, you get a period where it's all steady, that's a dry spell, and all of a sudden you get rain, down it goes. And in the winter there, I say, it was under four for quite some time. Eggs, eggs will not hatch in that. I mean, the eggs will just not hatch in that there at all. The, the, egg, the, the fry cannot get out of the egg. That, that's one of the reasons why we go for fry. You know, if we put eggs into these conditions, it'd be a waste of eggs. It'd be a waste of our time. That's what we're talking about, the sick to regen. The photo on the left, the before, the photo on the right, and after. Uh, Pictures like that great, it's just off a phone. It, it gives you the idea of what's happened. Uh, you're, you're just creating a far better habitat. 
obviously your broadleaf planting is it's 10, 15 years before it's going to be really beneficial. <coughs> Native trees, broadleaves. Again, if you look at a Sitka spruce, if you look a Sitka spruce attracts about 20 different kinds of insects. You get your aspen, alder, birch, they're, they're attracting somewhere between two and three hundred different species. So that you're, apart from the shade and, and the nutrients you can add into the water, you're attracting a, a, a bigger lot of insects. And fish do surface feed on insects, especially fry. Brute salt catcher, we've got a flat up photograph. Look, look, look a bit of a smurf. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's why it's a bit of fish in the peg gel burn next to the hatchery. It's, it's a low conductivity burn and it makes it very hard to hold fish. You, you could turn the electric fishing gear up, but the problem is you, you'll break back to the cock fish. So there's no point. <laughs> we, just, we just have to go for the hard work. This is a, a wee video, it's two minutes long, oh, sorry it's not, the back. <laughs> what did I do the update with this? I have to <laughs> click forward, <laughs> click right, we're on the next. <laughs> I should normally just click on it with a mouse. <laughs> <laughs> It's electrofishing, but it's not. It should just click on it. It should stop. You go back and just scroll back more. Twenty thousand of what we do, we keep 
to a size where we can think with them. We start talking about anywhere from July to October. Again, because of the facilities, we tend to try and keep them checked a wee bit. I, I don't want them grown too fast. I mean, I hear folks saying they want to grow them quick. I don't want them grown too fast and finishing up as S1s. I want to try and keep them as S2s so that they're staying in the river environment for at least a year. So what I tend to do is I will grade every tank and we'll, we'll take out the bigger ones, fin clip them, get them stocked out, that's giving them the tank. The fish that are left, smaller fish are trying to come on. We're continually doing that. We, we possibly can through the tanks, it could be four or five times within the season. Just turning them out, turning them out. As I say, if you don't, they will eventually start eating each other. An annual running cost for us, roughly £35,000. Uh, obviously, that's including insurance, it's my wages. Uh, I keep saying to folk, as a career move, actually, it's maybe not the way to go forward. Same <laughs> way, same way. Yeah. I, I didn't say wages, well, if, well, if, well, if, well, if you want to call it that. Uh, uh, it's a good job, but I love for salmon. Flight <laughs> uh, plate down next, obviously you've all seen this, uh, stripping, stripping the fish. The, the fancy technology David was using earlier on, well, I'll, I'll explain what I do. If, just for instance, I've got seven fish from the pine kiln ready, I will strip the seven of them into seven bowls. What I will then do is another seven bowls, and I'll take fish, uh, eggs from each of the first seven bowls and mix them. So then I finish off with seven bowls with eggs from seven fish. You follow that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so then what I'll do is I'll add a separate cock fish to each bowl. And then I'll use a spare, just in case. So basically, out of them seven pairs, you're getting a minimum of 49 pairs. Uh, and if you're using the eighth fish and he's managing to fertilise a few there, you've got it up to 50 on I mean, we had a meeting with Marine Scotland three, four years ago. Try to explain this to them. I mean, how, I mean, we talk about genetics. How do you know we are not doing a better job? By using seven, you know, you're talking about 49 pairs out of seven fish. That, that doesn't always happen, because if I've only got two fish ready, it, it, I, I might split that into three or four. So the more fish I've got ready, the, the bigger diversity you're going to get. But then, in my opinion, the numbers are getting so low now anyway. Uh, personally, I think that natural selection is starting to go out the window. Because, I mean, the your numbers are getting that so low, you're, you're, they're just going to make the what's there. I mean, if a, a cockfish is not going to swim up forever, well, that's, oh, that, that's my sister. <laughs> it's, 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 going to, it's going to be in there, that's it. <laughs> so I, I think we're at a stage now, uh, we, we still need to try and do the best we can, but, yeah. Okay, now it's laying, laying the eggs down in the trays. We, we, we use just a solid trough system. Uh, most of you will know at that stage the eggs are quite robust for a day or two. Then once they're in the trays, they become quite fragile. The incubator system, see this is an idea that come from a hatchery down south. Uh, as I said earlier on, we couldn't afford the marine ply, etc. So I had drums that I was going to be using for peasant feeders, and I thought, right, we can make incubators out of this. So. No, no, will you, will you want to turn around and, and look at that screen? Because it's just better on the live screen, that's not. So that's right. All right. It's my fault. I'm, right. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a very inexperienced director. Oh, <laughs> I've got Jeremy no Bain. problem. Yeah. It, it looks much the same as it is. <laughs> so the incubator system, basically all I'm trying to do is replicate the, what's happened in the river in the best I can. Al Alvins, if they're swimming about, if they use up their yolk sac too quick, you'll get a thing called nip yolk sac, which will basically kill all the Alvins. Doing it this system, I don't get any, don't get any <coughs> yolk sac whatsoever, and you tend to produce a better quality fish. Because they're using, they're using their yolk sac for growth rather than energy. If they're swimming about a tank using it for energy, they're smaller, as I say, you lose them through the yolk sac anyway. But 
the last bits when you show you, 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 your pipe coming in the bottom, which is your water supply, you've got a layer of gravel, you need some paddle rings on top of the gravel. <laughs> I, I don't use mesh anymore, I use plastic mesh now, uh, just a bit worried about the galvanisation on them. Two bricks on top just to hold the thing in place, add your fish, and they basically just sit in amongst the paddle rings and they, they don't move. And they'll, they'll sit in there for anything up to five or six weeks. Uh, the interesting thing with the incubator is I've got a clear pipe going in into the incubator from the top to let the light in. I put a lid on them, just shut them off. But once, once they are used up their yolk sack, they're then behaving like swim up right. So they are then looking for the light, they're coming up, coming through the pipe and dropping it in <coughs> the tank ready for feeding. Uh, not, not a great picture, but that's, that's fed fry that are just about to be stopped. Autumn fry, take that if it's been off them. It's a uh, laborious job, we need to tie them. Uh, yeah, it's, we are doing about 20,000. Electric fishing surveys, these, these are all, this, that survey there was last year, that was all stock sites. The, the top three is where we put the autumn fry. Although you see salmon fry in the top ones are living, they were actually fin clip fry that had been released, released two weeks before. Because of water conditions, I was quite, quite late in getting some of them out. I, I thought before I could get the electric fishing done in the top side, so I put them downstream by about 400 metres, thinking that these would not migrate upstream. Anyway, when I went to electric fish, these fry had migrated upstream. Uh, <coughs> that, that's minimum, de that's minimum density, densities per 100 square metres. If you look at the actual, uh, I can't remember what the thing is, but it's the, the, the good, very good, etc. Most, most of the sites are in the top of the range. The parts tend to thin out a bit, they, they tend to migrate more. <coughs> and the one the clock we burn, that was up in there. That's where we had a complete failure from the year before. So obviously there's no there's no salmon path from the year before either. That, that was the bottom that we showed you that was a 3.7 pH. That, that was the count in salmon fry this year, 50. And the growth rates were really good on them, which was quite surprising. <coughs> they're, they're just some of the fin clip salmon fry that they catch in while electric fishing. They, they are, they'll, they'll have been in the bottom for a year. But I think what we're doing there, we're probably producing our thoughts somewhere about 90% of what, what we're doing is S2s. Possibly 10% will be more than this ones. Some of them within the hatchery when you're feeding them, they just, uh, you just can't stop them from growing. They, they, they just shoot away. I mean, you can finish up with fish that size in your tank, and you still can fish that size. I'm quite sure they, they, they are going to go as this ones. This will be a bit, maybe, probably an eye opener for a lot of people, but. That's the rod catches for the last few years. I mean, we, we are in the red there. I mean, you can see, I mean, a hatch is not going to all of a sudden give you, you know, you're not all of a sudden going to have great catches. We've, we've kind of plateaued out. Uh, some years we'll get rises in it. You see some of the big rivers there, I mean, since 2000, early 2000, I mean, they, they just dropped off a cliff. I think there's a couple of boys in here from the Nith, I think, to walk and make out. I mean, I think two years ago, I think the Nith was down to about 180 fish from a road catch, you know, nearly 2,000, <coughs> oh, nearly 3,500. So it, it shows you how critical it is that, you know, we're all here today. We've got a river, the Loose, and you see in 220, it, it really kind of, up the trend. The, the feed as well that year as well. We up, in fact, we all did then. The, the Lush is quite a small river. Uh, 
Vi har ikke selvfølgelig lavet til bær og praktisk. Vi skulle have fået bær og rangbos. Der sidder fejl i de rarvids og dagen. I vil ikke have et graf, men jeg tror, der fejl ikke har været. Nu tager det fejl i de rarvids, og vi var der i 19 procent. Blank og der i de rarvids. Der er også en talking about talking about training. Næsten der er 83, der er en 72, der er 75, der er 63. Det er også bedre om en 3 year average. En 3 year average er sådan, at op 40 procent, hvis vi lukker det løs, er så 109 procent. Det er det, der 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 er Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's only one trend though. I mean, the, the trend is down. And, and that's all it was. I mean, even, I mean, even ourselves, I mean, we're running the hat today. In my opinion, what we're doing is we're, we're holding it kind of stable. I say, we're, we're, we're certainly not going to run the hat today, all of a sudden, these huge catches. <laughs> the time of Adipus film clips. David hit it on earlier on. We, we, we have a massive problem with, I think, under-reporting of fin clips. The only ones that I get reported is normally people that are involved with working with the hatchet or people that have got a right strong interest in it. We do pick the odd ones up where you've got an angler that's caught a fish and you'll send you a photograph. They haven't picked it up. We, we see, all right, it's had a fish and clip. Your rod catches is not really an indicator, I don't think. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't know what you'd multiply it back just by well, a prime example. I think it was 2010. I caught my first thing clip fish in the spring. I could see it straight away, just where I landed it. I beached it onto shallow water. It was lying on the side. I could see, it, I could see it before I even found it. The second one I caught was a grills. It was July, August time. Water was a bit bigger. I was more concerned about the fish, the fish elf, and I missed it. it was, I, I did manage to get a photograph holding the fish, got a photograph, went home, no, no adipus fin clip. It was no adipus fin. So I think if I can miss them, you know, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the problem is, I mean, you, you, now, nowadays we're, we're more concerned with making sure that, that fish is going back healthy. Yeah. Uh, the food stock catcher is a bit more different, it's a bit different because, again, that's in the pen kill and burn. I mean, you can see 2022 was, we, we couldn't get into the burn properly because, again, there was too much water. So we just couldn't electrofish it. That's hence the reason, you know, 18 fish catcher in total. The interesting thing there, though, I mean, you're looking at, the last year was 21.2%, 14 from 66 catcher. In that burn, we're, we're only stocking a fifth of what we stock in that burn with spin clips. So, if you, if you start doing the maths, I mean, what is the true figure of hatchery in the ton of fish? You know, on 23. I mean, somebody, somebody did push me on the Facebook page to try to get me to say it could be 100%. I don't believe that, but it's going to be an awful lot higher than 21.2. But to me, to me, the, the worrying thing about that is, in a sense, to, out of them 66 that we capture, we only take about hens and 10, 11 hens, maybe 6 or 7 cockfish. <laughs> so we're leaving big numbers in the burn still to reproduce on their own. In my opinion, these hatchery fish are getting a better return rate than wild fish. Sorry, Rudolf, can I just have a tell you sorry. Yep. Those fish that you're using for brew stock, do you take out the thin thick ones? No, put, put them back. You put those back put and take care of them. I don't know. If you listen to what I've just said, though, there's only a fifth of what we put in as fin clips. There's four fifths. You know, there's, a, there's another 50,000 that are clipped. So when we are taking them for brew stock, we haven't got a clue what they are. You know, we, we can still be taking hatchery fish back to the hatchery, we don't know. Uh, I would say, in my opinion, I, I think that 
hatching fish for some reason are doing better than that world in well fishing. Which I think probably, I don't, I don't ask me why. I say, if you just, I mean, obviously that's 66 catch up, that's not all the fish out of the bottom either. The condition of the brood stocks hatching returns, were they in better condition than the wild brood stock? <coughs> I, I would have said there was no difference. I, I think, whether it's hatchery or not, I think we slightly get a better size spring fish now, Jamie. Do you agree with that? <coughs> yeah, no. I mean, for a while there, we were getting spring fish that were more kind of 9, 10, 11. Uh, but if they're not, they're not, if they're not clipped, you don't know anyway. No, so. no. I mean, luckily enough, before we left yesterday, Jamie was meant to pick me up at one o'clock. He phoned me at one minute to one and said, I'll be late, can you come and photograph this fish for me? <laughs> so, I, it's a good reason to be late. But we were hoping it might have been a fin fit, because that would be nicer than the cake today. <laughs> But yeah, we don't know. I mean, we are, we are trying to look to go down the road and try to do some genetic sampling. Because if we, if we could get the funding to do that, I mean, the answer would be definitive, wouldn't it? You, you could eventually turn around and say, right, they, they work for the don't work. And I think that's what we need. But in my, in my opinion, when you see that there, I mean, we're only talking about 10,000 fin clips. Don't, don't get that confused with the return rate though. That's not the return rate. That's percentage of fish captured. That was the very first fin clip fish that we caught. And again, we didn't realise it was fin clip until we went to put it in the hatchery. And then we realised what it was and it went back into the bottom. <coughs> the hatchery is here to do that man stand and that's the gap between the hatchery. That, that actual fish was caught up with 40 yards from the hatchery. Mm -hmm. not, not that I tend to do with where it come from, it's just that was a coincidence. <coughs> There's a the man up there, you'll see loads of photos of him. Uh, that, that was, I think Jamie had three springers that year, all fin clip. That, that was the two fin clips that I caught. Uh, you can't see the well in the spring fish. I mean, you look, I mean that, that's fine, this is like a tuna. You know, I mean, that, that's not inferior to anything else. The, that's one that I missed. And you can clearly see, you can see there's not an, an additive spin, it's, it's normally just a wee, just a wee bump, but it's fully skinned over. That was electrofishing for Bridgestore. We, we took five fish out of that pool, four of them were fin clipped. Unfortunately, there only was four of us, so we could only photograph three. Yeah, they were all pills. The fin clips this year, we haven't had many kelps in the river this year, but two of the kelps that we have caught have also been fin clips. One of them estimate that when it came in last year, it might have been a bit. 10 fish about 15 pounds possibly. So, I mean, the, the fin clips are also adding to, to the capacity of the river. The future for us, identify further stocking sites. Uh, again, that will be through electrofishing. I mean, there's still areas where we don't have any wild spawning. It'd be nice to increase the percentage of autumn fry that we're releasing. Uh, again, I'll probably have to put another bay on the side of the hatchery. And I'll have to speak to the Secretary of the Trust and his finger out. Look for some funding. Uh, talking about water quality, just through the Sunday and that that we're doing, we need to address that now. We have been in talks with our Scottish uh, SEPA. We are getting talks with them. See, we'll not be able to do much because, I mean, most of the land is commercial forestry. I mean, all, all we can hope for is maybe increased buffer zones. It'd also be nice, I mean, the forestry have to plant a certain percentage of broadleaves. They've also got to have a certain percentage of open space. But it'd be nice if they used that along the water courses instead of along the roadsides. Unfortunately, they wanted the roadsides because it's easier to shoot here. Uh, it's just going to help us. 
can you maintain the habitat? I mean, I don't know if anyone's follow our Facebook page, but we're out there. This year we've been doing more maintenance work on the work we've been doing over the last eight or nine years by replacing dead trees and removing the tubes off the trees that have got, got tall enough and strong enough that can be taken off. And again, we expand our education programme. There was another bit of it. I do catch the odd fish. Um, future to me again is the youngsters educating them. Uh, to, to me, what I want to do is make sure that we've got salmon in our river for my grandkids to go and fish whether they want to fish or not. And if we don't, if we don't do something now, <coughs> that's not going to be the case. There was a video at the end, but I don't think it's going to work either because it's the same format. <laughs> That's right. You're supposed to play every format. <laughs> 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 no, it worked to me. I had to just click it, and then start playing. So that, that's, that's our story. I hope you found it as interesting as what I feel it is. <laughs> <laughs>